By the autumn of 1952, the Korean War had been raging for almost three years, with South Korea and the United Nations Command going toe-to-toe with North Korea and China. While the first years of the conflict had been a seesawing affair, it had now settled into a stalemate, with little territory changing hands despite a series of attritional battles. Peace negotiations had begun in the so-called truce village of Panmunjom, but they had made little headway and fighting raged all the while. It was during this period of stalemate that Lieutenant Eric Pedersen of the 1st Marine Division, United States Marine Corps, walked into the Seoul racetrack with the intention of buying a horse. Pedersen commanded a recoilless rifle platoon. Despite its name, the signature weapon of the unit was an anti-tank artillery piece that fired a 75mm projectile. It was a powerful weapon, and its crews were given the nickname Reckless Riflemen, both as a contraction of recoilless and as a reference to the weapon's notorious blowback. The problem for Pedersen was that the weapon's shells weighed 24 pounds each, and the mountainous terrain of the battlefront meant that the marines charged with carrying the ammunition quickly became exhausted. What he needed was a pack horse. He had already sent a letter to his wife in California, asking her to mail a pack saddle. Now all he needed was the animal itself, hence his arrival at the racetrack. Many of the animals in the stables were in poor condition, with the years of war taking their toll on the level of care. There was one, though, that caught Pedersen's eye. A little red filly of good Mongolian stock, with three white socks and a thick blaze on her head. She was in fine condition as well. The horse's owner, a young boy named King Huck Moon, was reluctant to part with his best friend whom he had named Flame. However, Pedersen offered 250 US dollars for the animal, money that actually came out of his own pocket. For Kim, this was enough to buy a prosthetic leg for his sister, who had stepped on a landmine. With no small amount of sadness, Kim said goodbye to his companion and handed Flame's reins to the American Marine. Little did she know it, but the filly's life was about to change forever. As for the marines, well, they had no idea what they were in for either. To transport the horse, Pedersen had borrowed a trailer, which turned out to be a little small, to say the least. Nonetheless, he was able to coax Flame onto the trailer, and they made their way back to base. Though understandably shaky on the trailer at first, It would not be long until Flame became an expert trailer rider, mounting and dismounting with practiced ease. Now, of course, in order to fulfill the role that they had earmarked for her, she needed training. To that end, Pedersen put the horse in the care of Platoon Sergeant Joe Latham, who would become her dearest friend. Now, every horse needs a good name. When Pedersen asked his men what they should call her, Someone at the back shouted, Reckless. Immediately, everyone agreed, and they all came forward to welcome Reckless to the platoon. And little did they know just how apt that name would be. For her part, Reckless settled quickly into her new life, and within a few days, she was no longer tied to her bunker, but was instead free to roam in the camp. She explored every corner of her new home, frequently popping into the Marines' tents to see what they were doing. Perhaps her favourite place was the galley, which she quickly discovered was an excellent source of food. Her diet included horse feed, apples, carrots and oats, but her favourite appeared to be the chocolate Hershey's Kisses. Indeed, it soon became apparent that Reckless had a propensity to eat just about anything. Whether or not it was actually edible was irrelevant. Anything that came within range of her mouth was fair game. As for her training, Latham put Reckless through what he called hoof camp, as opposed to boot camp. He taught her to recognise barbed wire and to wait for her handler to guide her through or around the obstacle. He taught her to seek cover in the event that the platoon came under enemy fire. If there was no cover, 
Latham trained Reckless to lie down. He even taught her to kneel and crawl, in case she needed to get into a shallow bunker. Reckless took to all this training like a duck to water, and her comrades quickly became enamoured with her. Word spread quickly, and soon marines from other units were dropping in to meet the newest recruit. Even Major General Edwin Pollock, commanding officer of the entire 1st Marine Division, went out of his way to make an appearance and to see the horse for himself. Apparently, he liked what he saw. Once the pack saddle arrived, hoof camp began in earnest. After testing various configurations, Pedersen and Latham decided six rounds of ammunition was the ideal load. Reckless didn't appear to be unduly burdened, and they were easy enough to secure. In extreme circumstances, she could be configured to carry eight to ten, but Pedersen ruled this was only a last resort. For comparison, the average bipedal marine could carry a maximum of three rounds. After a particularly tough training run in the hills, Latham poured a bottle of Coca-Cola into his helmet on a whim and offered it to Reckless. She guzzled it and asked for more. By this point, all that was left was for Reckless to experience the concussive blast of the recoilless rifle. The weapon system was usually fired at a rate of 4 to 5 rounds a minute, so it was essential that she become accustomed to the boom. According to Latham, the first time the recoilless rifle fired in her vicinity, she jumped straight up into the air, all four hooves leaving the ground. With Latham soothing her, the second time she jumped again, though not as high, and afterwards she started investigating what was making the noise. By the fifth time, Reckless barely batted an eye, and instead started eating the liner from a discarded helmet. During that operation, she made five trips between the supply depot and the gun. At one point, they came under enemy artillery fire, and though she was visibly sweating, Reckless appeared otherwise unfazed. The day was a success. Back at camp, the marines were having a beer, and naturally, Reckless demanded one too. Just as she had with the coke, she downed it and asked for more. Later that night, she decided she didn't want to sleep in her bunker, so she made her way to Latham's tent. Latham wiped off the rain and rearranged the tent so that she could sleep next to the heater. This was the first of many nights spent in her comrades' tents, especially once the freezing Korean winter set in. By that point, there was no doubt, Reckless was a Marine. Many military units on deployment adopt animals as mascots. It's a simple and effective means of improving morale amongst the soldiers. Unsurprisingly, dogs were probably the most common. But Reckless was so much more than that. While she was undoubtedly the pride of her regiment and the marines doted on her, she also served a practical function. When the bullets started flying and the shells started falling, she was there alongside her beloved comrades. Indeed, so beloved was she that whenever her platoon came under enemy artillery fire, the marines would shed their protective flak jackets and use them to cover Reckless, rendering themselves more vulnerable just to keep her safe. She also fulfilled practical roles when the regiment was taken off the front line. When it came to laying down telephone cables, Reckless could make more progress in a day than ten of her bipedal comrades. During further operations, it became apparent that Reckless only needed to be shown a supply route once or twice. After that, she could manage on her own. In February of 1953, the Marines launched a raid on Chinese positions. During this operation, Reckless made 24 trips between the supply depot and the firing sites, carrying six rounds per trip. Pedersen estimated she had travelled at least 20 miles and had a total carry weight of around 3,500 pounds. Naturally, the very appreciative Marines gave her a thorough rub down later that night, and after a hearty meal, Pedersen covered her with a blanket. She was asleep before he had even left the room. For her actions during this raid, she was promoted to corporal. Military mascots are often given honorary ranks. 
this was not one of those occasions. Reckless was recognised as an actual marine and was thus incorporated into the rank structure of the unit. Word of her exploits spread throughout the United Nations forces. One Australian soldier even gave her one of their distinctive slouch hats, and, being Australian myself, I can tell you that this is no small thing. For her part, Reckless absolutely hated the hat, and it was eventually eaten. All of the qualities that made Reckless a special horse were truly put to the test during the Battle for Outpost Vegas in March 1953, in what was to be her finest hour. In the evening of the 26th of March, thousands of Chinese troops began assaulting defensive positions occupied by the 1st Marine Division. One such position was Outpost Vegas, which fell to the Chinese after hours of intense fighting. As the Marines prepared a counterattack in the early morning of the 27th, Reckless was tasked with supplying the various recoilless rifle emplacements that were supporting the American advance. To reach these emplacements, Reckless would be required to traverse a steep slope and, given the urgency of the situation, she was loaded up with eight rounds instead of the usual six. The total weight for each trip was 192 pounds. The fighting lasted the entire day. Under intense enemy artillery fire, Reckless made solo trip after solo trip between the supply depot and the gun emplacements. By midday, she was visibly tired. Latham gave her a half hour break, let her have what little water he could get his hands on, and fed her some candy. After a quick wipe down, she resumed her relentless solo march along the trail. By mid-afternoon, her head had dropped, and her pace had slowed to a crawl. Eventually, she had to rest three or four times just to make it up the slope. She was utterly exhausted. And at some point, a piece of shrapnel nicked her above the ear. Later, she suffered another minor wound on her flank. But she didn't stop. She never stopped. She just kept going. By the time the fighting ceased around nightfall on the 27th, Reckless was out on her feet. The Marines coaxed her back to the camp, where she demolished a pile of hay and settled down for a well-earned rest. Over the course of the day, Reckless had made 51 solo trips between the depot and the guns. She had carried 386 rounds, more than 9,000 pounds of explosives, and Pedersen calculated she had travelled in excess of 35 miles. She had maintained such a steady supply of ammunition that the barrel of one of the recoilless rifles had turned white hot and had become sufficiently deformed so as to render it unusable. After a long night's rest, Reckless continued to do supply runs until the battle came to an end on the 30th though luckily she was not required to repeat the heroics of the 27th. After the battle, the entire battered 1st Marine Division was transferred off the front line for the first time in many months. Fortunately, the remainder of the war was far less exciting for Reckless. In July 1953, an armistice was signed, and the fighting ceased, though I should note that a peace treaty was never signed, and so technically, North and South Korea are still at war to this day. Anyway, in October 1953, many of her marines were promoted or transferred back to the US. Though it was a particularly sad goodbye for Latham and Pedersen, Reckless did not suffer for their absence. All of the marines in her regiment, and even the entire division, were incredibly invested in her care. It was a running joke that the quickest way to find yourself in lockup was for Lieutenant General Randolph Pate to find Reckless's bunker in anything less than pristine condition during one of his regular visits to see the Little Red Horse. In November 1953, it was decided by Marine Command that Reckless was in need of a promotion. And this wasn't going to be some sort of nondescript affair. The Marines went the whole nine yards. 
Since she obviously could not wear a uniform, her comrades organised for a tailor to make her a special silk saddle blanket. A review stand was set up, and General Pate and Colonel Elby Martin, commanding officer of the 5th Marine Regiment, were in attendance. With the company in full parade, Reckless's citation was read aloud, stating in part, Reckless's attention and devotion to duty makes her well qualified for promotion to the rank of sergeant. Her absolute dependability while on missions under fire contributed materially to the success of many battles. General Pate then pinned the stripes to Reckless's new blanket. She was officially a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. Word soon spread of the equine marine sergeant. Newspaper articles were written about her all over the US and she became something of a celebrity. As the US began winding down its troop numbers in Korea in 1954, talk began of taking Reckless back to America when the division was rotated home. It's an unfortunate reality that animals of war, be they mascot or warhorse, have in the past often been left behind when a unit returns from overseas. The Marines of the 1st Division were determined that that would not be the case with Reckless. In October 1954, Reckless finally began the long journey across the Pacific Ocean to her new home. Everything going according to plan, she would even arrive in time for the United States Marine Corps Birthday Ball, one of the most important events on the Marine Corps calendar, and one at which she was to be the guest of honour. However, once the ship arrived in San Francisco, Reckless's entry into the US was not an especially smooth affair. The US Department of Agriculture would not allow her to disembark without undergoing blood tests to make sure she was not carrying diseases, such as glanders or durine. Apparently, when informed that durine is an equine sexually transmitted disease, many of the marines that had served at her side in Korea were absolutely furious at what they considered a slight on her honour. In addition, the marines who accompanied her made the rookie error of leaving the parade saddle blanket within her reach. By the time they realised what was happening, she had eaten all but a few scraps. Pedersen, who had travelled to meet her on the docks, rushed to organise a replacement blanket. When Reckless finally set foot on US soil, she did so with Pedersen by her side, and she was greeted by a pack of photographers eager to get a snapshot of the famous horse. Luckily, the new saddle blanket was ready just in time for the birthday ball later that night. When she arrived at the birthday ball, Reckless was the centre of attention, just as she liked it. By all accounts, she entered the banquet hall as if she owned it, and stood at the head of the table and ate cake and guzzled Coca-Cola, with cameras flashing all the while. When there was no more cake to be had, she also ate the floral centrepieces. In other words, she had the time of her life. A few days later, Reckless was on her way to her new home at Camp Pendleton, California, the home of the 5th Marine Regiment. The Marine Corps had agreed that Reckless would be treated as a VIP for the rest of her life, and they were also careful to ensure she would never be exploited for commercial reasons. During her time at Pendleton, Reckless had three foals that survived to adulthood. Fearless, Dauntless, and Chesty, the latter being named after Chesty Puller, the most decorated Marine in US history. In 1959, Reckless was formally promoted to Staff Sergeant, awarded by her old friend Randolph Pate, who was by that time Commandant of the Marine Corps. The ceremony was complete with a 19-gun salute and a full parade of 1,700 Marines from her combat unit. She officially retired from the Marine Corps a year later and was provided free quarters and feed in lieu of retirement pay. At the end of her military career, her full medals and citations were as follows. United Nations Korean Service Medal, National Defence Service Medal, 
Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal, Navy Unit Commendation, United States Korean Service Medal, Presidential Unit Citation, Two Purple Hearts, and the Republic of Korea Presidential Unit Citation. After a peaceful retirement, Reckless died in 1968 at the estimated age of 19 or 20. In 2013, a statue of Reckless was unveiled at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. A second statue was dedicated at Camp Pendleton in 2016, a fitting tribute to the Little Red Horse who became a United States Marine. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you would like to see more videos like this one, make sure you like and subscribe and turn on notifications. You can find more history content on the Real History website via the link in the description. Finally, as always, I would like to thank my patrons for their ongoing support. If you are considering becoming a patron, you can head over to the Real History Patreon page via the link in the description to see what kind of benefits you can get. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.